Matt Rossier. My mother was an immigrant from Jamaica uh, who came by way of Cuba. My father was a French citizen, always. Uh, my interest in 3D printing came about primarily from uh, my best friend. He was hugely into it, and I really wasn't that inter interested. Uh, I've always been working with my hands. I used to be a mechanic before I went to law school, so I learned a lot about metalworking and welding and that sort of thing. And he actually kind of thrust upon me a 3D printer, and I started just, the more I had it, the more I would kind of just use it for little things whenever I'd be missing a part or need something, and it kind of just, I just grew. I, now I don't know what I would do without it. Anything that you can make out of plastic, you can make with a 3D printer. So, so even some things that you wouldn't typically consider to be made from plastic. I use it a lot for prototyping. When I'm going to make something like on my lathe out of metal, uh, I can prototype it on a 3D printer and see exactly how large it needs to be, um, internal diameters, different sort of things that I can hash out much more quickly and with a lot less work. This is a model of a 1918 Libero, which would have been would have been the French the first French assault rifle. Only two of them ever existed, so you can't just get your hands on them. And the only information that's out here on these is one photograph and somebody measured one apparently once. So this actually was in a video game not too long ago. So I pulled that model out of the video game. I scaled it to the dimensions and was able to print a full-size model. And so from this, I'm using this as a reference to begin building the parts to make a real life replica from steel. Without 3D printing, it would be a much more difficult process to be able to get to something like this. Being able to 3D print this is in a couple days, you can now hold something that in real life doesn't exist anymore. So I have a lot of like very strange guns. Of really particular interest to me is this French 1886 Labelle. This British Lee Enfield Moss 1936. This one was made in 1940, immediately during, uh, before the Battle of France. So God knows what this weapon has seen. From a historical perspective, 3D printing has allowed me to get, get towards weapons that are really uh, either just not available in the civilian market here in the US or just like exceedingly expensive. The printer actually comes in use in weird ways that I would have never imagined. This is a deactivated 1915 Shosha, uh, the first machine gun ever really fielded that was man portable by a military. Shosha was the primary French uh, machine rifle. It was a machine rifle, totally weird. This is the first of its kind. And then you can look at it and just see how similar it is to a lot of stuff we have now. These it are really difficult to get on the civilian market. To get a, one that's a functional machine gun costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Most of them were chopped up like this one after the National Firearms Act came into play. I found this one in a parking lot sale, all in a bunch of scattered, scattered pieces. Guy really wasn't sure what it was. I looked and I'm like, that's a Shosha. Uh, and of course it was missing a bunch of parts from being destroyed so that it's no longer considered a firearm. So I 3D printed parts just so I can put it up on the wall. It's not functional, but now I have something that, I mean, the steel that's there served in World War I. And then I was able to print the missing parts and just be able to display it as a non-functional weapon. I am on the hunt for a registered Shosha. A printer let me be able to have one that I can just display for really cheap. Using 3D printing can help you keep some stranger, older, more relic and curio weapons alive. You really wouldn't want to depend on these parts because there's almost nothing that you can really safely make from brittle plastic. Steel has spring properties that you really need for, even for areas you don't really think about it, like a barrel, really needs to be able to resonate and flex with each shot and then go back to the exact way it was before, and plastic just can't really do that. These ghost guns are the new wave of American gun violence. This is part of a long pattern of letting the gun lobby get whatever they want, even if safety is at risk, even if terrorists could gain the upper hand. We've seen time and time again, whenever something new happens with gun technology, 
We know that the general public and the media reaction is not going to be informed. It's just going to be panic. And so this type of massive response of just constraint and doing everything you possibly can to push back on what is really an advancement in technology that's on net good is unsurprising from a culture of uninformed gun control alarmism. So people are really worried about these fully 3D printed guns like the Liberator, the Songbird, these guns that are made almost entirely from plastic. Of course, you still need a few metal components. They really can't be used in the way people are afraid of. People are afraid that you'll use it, you know, you'll use its plastic capabilities to get through airport and use it to assassinate someone or something like that. With a completely plastic gun, with a plastic barrel, it has to be so large to be able to contain the pressure of even a like relatively modest cartridge power-wise like the 380 that it's not very concealable, that, that all goes down the tubes. And then second of all, there's no reliable way to make plastic rifling. So you're gonna have an unstable shot. So the effective range is only gonna be about, I'd say, 20 feet. This just doesn't make sense when there are other options available. Well, what we have here is the, the parts for the, that Liberator pistol everyone's so worried about. It's little panels where we'll put in our, our steel weight. This, the size of this thing, to fire a single shot of three, and there's our barrel here. This is effectively what it looks like. Look at the size of this thing to get one shot of 380. And for comparison, this, which is about 250 bucks, gives you seven. And this can fire repeatedly, seven shots, one shot after the other. This is pretty much a one shot deal, because like we said, this barrel is plastic. When you fire that first shot, it's gonna deform. It's you might be lucky and be able to, one, you're not gonna be able to just pull it out. The case is gonna expand into it. You're gonna have to really jam the case out with a rod. Um, if you're really patient, you'll be able to fire another shot off within the same time that somebody with a Revolutionary War fl flintlock pistol would be able to. So then people are super concerned about 3D printed guns, about being able to buy a weapon without a background check and what have you. And what people aren't aware of is, like I said, it really doesn't make a difference. This is this was made in the 1970s and they make these right now. This is not considered a firearm by our government. And this is a six shot, 36 caliber repeating revolver. You can get these in 44 caliber and they can really pack a punch. And like I said, you can buy these online, have it shipped straight to your door. Do I think that's a bad thing? No, again, people don't go robbing banks with these. But you'd think instead of printing out a massive anemic single shot weapon, wouldn't a, wouldn't a criminal be better off with something like this? I mean, at least you've got six shots repeating firepower with this. Of course, they don't. What do they do? They buy guns off the street. This, it just isn't an issue. We, it doesn't change anything. If you tried to make a complete AK-47 on a 3D printer, you'd have a unbelievably catastrophic failure right off the bat. First of all, the chamber area needs to be, would need to be so large if you made it from plastic, it, it would, it wouldn't look like an AK-47. So you just did like one to one, first shot, the gun would explode. I, I mean, there, there's no prettier way to put that, it would explode. Plastic just can't hold up to all of the gas pressure that's resulted from firing a, you know, a powerful cartridge like that. So people have been making their own guns at home for as long as ammunition has existed, and even actually before fixed ammunition existed. We have to remember way back in the 1500s, the first guns were just tubes that you put gunpowder into with a flash hole, and then you'd put whatever into, like the blunderbuss that was used by the British Navy. It's just a, basically a big barrel that you'd put powder and then like whatever, rocks, doesn't matter, on top of it, set off the powder and then it would come out the barrel. These were very simple weapons. Stuff like the Liberator, stuff like the Sombird is more of a zip gun than of a really conventional firearm the way you think of it. A zip gun is something that is just so simple. It's generally the simplest iteration of a zip gun is two pieces of pipe, one of which holds the cartridge, the other of which has a firing pin of some sort, and you smash the pipes together and it goes off. That is really what these 3D printed guns are at their core, is zip guns. They're single shot, single use weapons. Comparatively, a zip gun that you can make at home is more reliable than a Liberator, than a Songbird. Uh, it'll be more, you'll be able to use it repeatedly with standard steel pipe, uh, and more safely, to be honest. It has always been legal in the United States to make a gun for yourself. 
If you make a gun with the intention to sell it to someone else, that's a different story. But that's really more of a tax law concern than anything else because you're not paying your occupational taxes and being a firearms manufacturer. It has always been legal to make a gun. Now, it's not, you can't just make a machine gun. It has to, be, it has to follow the, the National Firearms Act. You can't make a, a shot, sawn off shotgun, you know, whatever. As long as you follow the rules, it has always been legal to make a gun for your own personal use, yes. Well, there's all kinds of cliche reasons that you hear about why the right to bear arms is important. I'm a first generation American, so it was really drilled into my head by my parents that this place is really different from home. You know, people here really are, they question the government and that makes it more legitimate. They, and they have the capability to fight back and that all on balance makes things more legitimate. And if, you're, if you even have the slimmest bit of uh, libertarian in your body, if you have ever once thought you know, well, why? Why is this happening? You ought to want to have the capacity to defend yourself against somebody who's doing something illegal. In other countries, people don't have the right to defend themselves. They, they don't. It's, if you're attacked, it's, I'm sorry, too bad. Here it's different. We consider it as granted. And if you look all the way back to the, the founding, it, it was granted that there was one thing that you couldn't regulate, there's one thing that you can't take away from somebody, and that's a, the ability to defend themselves if they are illegally attacked. That is something that is so important, and I, I can't imagine a world, I, I can't imagine living in a society where I didn't feel secure in myself. And that's what that enables us as Americans, is we know that if anybody does something illegal to try to destroy us, we have the right to protect ourselves. I, I can't imagine living without that. This is one of the pieces of software we can use to view and modify and mess with uh, 3D models. This is what's called the slicer. And so the slicer, what you do is you import the models that you actually want to print. Let's put in a liberator frame right here. So this is actually a 3D representation of my printer's build surface. And this is the program that the printer is going to run. And you can see it actually follows the nozzle. This is how it's going to print out your 3D file, layer by layer. Well, I don't, I don't know if people know what they're objecting to here. We've seen the headlines change from 3D printable gun files to downloadable guns to 3D guns, which I find inexplicable because I think it's a prerequisite to being a gun to exist in three dimensions. I mean, a, a, a 2D gun isn't much of a gun, is it? Uh, so I, I'm not sure people know what they're objecting to. I think, I think it's like most cases of gun hysteria where people just, they don't know and it scares them. If you want to stop people from trading the files, the blueprints effectively to 3D print guns, it would take such a ridiculous draconian measure, it, it's insane. I, I actually can't think of a way to really stop it. Um, it would be, I mean, you'd have to like force everybody to install something on their computer that detected these files and, and delete it. It would take something insane like that. It would have to be in every home. I cannot imagine a United States, maybe in China we could, we could find a way to pre prevent these files from being traded because everyone uses the government controlled internet. But in the, in the United States, I can't imagine a way to actually stop it, no. If you want to really effectively restrict this, you're gonna have to restrict the technology. And these printers are, I mean, guns are one, and gun parts are one tiny little thing of what they do. I mean, I printed out a coat rack the other day. I printed out organizers, different, just different little things, little statues that I've given to people. What we see a lot of these things being used for is prosthetics. You go from, uh, say you've got a child who's born without a limb or who's an amputee. If you go to a typical prosthetist, it's like $20,000 each go and they're outgrowing these things in a few months. Just that alone, wouldn't you say is worth it to have this technology be unregulated and left alone so that people can have access to this stuff and really innovate? Even if, I'd say even if we were able to get to the point where people are printing metal in their homes which I don't think is in the cards, I don't think that's in the foreseeable future, but even if that were the case, wouldn't you rather accept guns be marginally easier to access, but still have medical advancements and technology e more easily accessible to people? Isn't that worth it to you? 
I'd say, I mean, and me, who's a gun guy, I'd say even if this thing couldn't do guns, I'd still want it in my house for that reason alone.